Right? And finally, for this, this block on this exam, we're going to do translation of proteins, or protein synthesis. And we've already talked about the amino acids themselves, and we've talked about how the RNA is made, such as mRNAs and tRNAs, and how they're modified, so in some cases heavily modified, like the tRNAs were. And now we need to see how all those actors and players come together to do protein synthesis. And so this started out with a, a, an endeavor to crack what we now call as the genetic code. And it took about a decade to do it, in the, the mid-50s to mid-60s in the 20th century. And we'll, we'll start with some guesses, right? And that's really how it started. They knew that RNA had to be the information carrier and the resultant protein was programmed by an RNA molecule because that information ultimately resides in the DNA. And they knew the DNA directed the synthesis of RNA by the base pairing, complementary pairing, that easily to figure that out compared to this one. Um, and then we knew that the mRNA had to direct the synthesis of a protein. How it did that, didn't know yet. So the, like this uh, Rosetta Stone you see here, it was created specifically for the purposes of teaching translation between languages. Right? So this Rosetta Stone had the Egyptian hieroglyphs on the top and then two versions of the Greek script underneath. So you could translate from Egyptian to Greek to other Greek. Right? So it, they kind of did the same thing here. We have an mRNA language, which is made entirely of four letters of the alphabet, right? A's, G's, C's, and U's. And then we had to translate that into a 20-letter alphabet of amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids that can be put in. So it's a much more diverse alphabet. How do you do that kind of translation? Let's start with the simplest of assumptions, which we know is wrong, but it's a good place to start. How about one base, let's say uracil, since it's the most unique to RNA, and we know a DNA won't have this. How about uracil directs the synthesis of one amino acid? That's a good starting guess, a first hypothesis, which we know is wrong, but it's a good starting point. And this is where they started in 1955. They knew if you make a string of RNA that is entirely uracil, just poly U, right, many, many bases long, just uracils, you put them together, you will always get the same protein, right? So if you put your cells together, it will always make a polyprotein that is nothing but phenylalanine. It's phenylalanine after phenylalanine after phenylalanine, nothing else. So the first assumption is, which is not a bad assumption, it's what the evidence points to, is uracil means phenylalanine goes in. Well, if that's the case, which we know isn't true, even then they knew it wasn't accurate, then there would be plenty more phenylalanines than we see, because U is pretty common, right? It occurs all the time. It's one out of every four, basically. So that can't be the case. And it also would limit us to only having four possible amino acids. Each base would direct one amino acid. So that can't be the case. So someone had the idea of, well, the if we can read the, the bases of the RNA two at a time, perhaps we read two bases, and that encodes for one amino acid, then we read the next two bases, and that encodes for another. There may even be some overlap where we read the first and second base, and then we read the second and third base, and then we read the third and fourth base. Each one gets read multiple times. They didn't know. It's a possibility. But if, if you still make poly U, it would still makes phenylalanine, that analysis still applies. If I read it two at a time, I'm still going to get phenylalanine. But in this scenario, how many possible amino acids could I code for if I read it two at a time? What do you think? If, if I read the bases one at a time, there's only four possibilities. 16. There'd be 16 because it's four in the first slot and independently four in the second slot because I could still use the same base again. So there's 16 possible ones. Well, we know there's 20 amino acids. So perhaps they thought, well, that's really close. Maybe there's some curiosities in there where, um, say, UA might actually have two possible codes. It's not a direct. It always makes this. It might make two different things depending on other features. And that's not an unreasonable assumption because there's some quirks to the biology works. So they thought that might work, and they tried that for a few years. And then finally, someone said, well, what if you tried it three at a time? 
Well, how many possibilities would there be three at a time? What's four times four times four? 64 possibilities. We only have 20 amino acids. That seems a bit excessive, right? It doesn't seem as close as 16. You're almost there, right? So in fact, it does work three at a time is what they discovered. And we have some, ambi sorry, not ambiguity, but redundancy or degeneracy in the code. And that leaves out any ambiguity because one triplet or codon, three bases in a row, will never code for more than one amino acid. So one triplet, one codon, UUU for instance, or you know UUA, or CCC, or CAC, whatever you want to pick, codes for one and only one amino acid. So no ambiguity. But because there's 64 possibilities and only 20 amino acids, either many of them aren't used or more than one codon could code for the same amino acid. That's degeneracy, right? So we don't have ambiguity, but we could have degeneracy or redundance in the process. And that's exactly what we have. So there's no ambiguous coding, but there could be a lot of degenerate coding or multiple codons for the same amino acid. But there's never multiple amino acids for the same codon. So the genetic code that was deciphered after those 10 years is nearly universal. There are some differences, such as mitochondria are different from the eukaryotic, what we call universal, but it's not really universal. And different other bacteria have their own codes. And uh, for the most part, uh, mammals and other animals, we all use the same codes, except in our mitochondria. Um, those are more like the, the bacterial codes. And then we have some yeast that have some specific codes and so forth. But the most common one from our point of view for animals, we're going to call the universal code. Okay, And here's some features of that code. We knew it was specific. One codon, each codon codes for one and only one amino acid. Okay? And a codon is three nucleotides in a row. The code does not have any overlap. So if I read three, I am done with those. I don't read parts of that again. There's no overlap. There's no punctuation, like uh, a specific A doesn't sound for a, a comma or a pause or a period or something like that. And it has directionality. So if I said CAA is not the same thing as AAC. And we knew the directionality came from the fact that the mRNA molecule was also directional, has a five prime and three prime end, so you can only read it one way. And in fact, it's read five prime to three prime. That's different. If you go back to our last lecture, at the beginning we explained that it's different from when you're making nucleic acids. And the, the protein is assembled amino to carboxysat. Okay. So because there's 64 combinations, there must be more than one combination, more than one codon, or more than one triplet for each amino acid. And some of them aren't used at all. Right? So of the 64 possible codons, 61 actually specify amino acids, and then the, what we call universal genetic code, three of them are termed stop codons, right? And the three stop codons are UAA, UAG, and UGA, okay? All right, so besides the stop codons, we also have something called the initiation codon or start codon, and for the most part, it's almost always the same. It does vary a little bit from species to species. We have some other ones in eukaryotes especially, but it's generally the codon that codes for methionine, the AUG. Now, sometimes you may see this written ATG, which is not a codon. There are no Ts in the mRNA. It's uracils. But when they say ATG is a start codon, what they're really referring to is the DNA that held that information to make that mRNA was originally an ATG, the coding strand. So you may see that sometimes, but in actuality, it's, it's not technically correct. We should say the codon is the mRNA's code, the AUG, but the DNA that coded for it, or the coding strand, would read ATG. Okay. So here's the genetic code, the, the generic one, or the, the what's termed universal one. Do I want you to memorize this code? Of course not. I want you to memorize some features of the code. So if you notice, it's arranged in a way, this is not the only valid way to display this. There's some other cool graphic ones, some ways to do it as well, that display the information slightly differently and it has some advantages. But this one has a way of looking at what I want you to see at it. So if you look at it, it's arranged in columns and rows. 
where the first position is in each of the four rows, U, C, A, or G, and the second position is in the, the columns. So for example, the second column all has C in the second position, right? The third row all has A in the first position and so forth. And then each of those 16 blocks of those pairings, you know, for, by rows and columns, four rows, four columns are 16 blocks. Each of those has all four possibilities in the third position, listed U, C, A, G again. Okay. Do you see any features that stand out about this arrangement? There's lots of, of patterns in here, and your brain's really good at picking out patterns. So what do you see that stands out? Just let's name a few things. So what sort of patterns do you guys see? Changing the uh, third amino acid. Changing the third? Not the third amino acid, the third uh, uh, nucleotide. What about it? You're changing it. Well, I'm changing So, so I, I, when, when you change it, it uh, doesn't affect the amino acid it codes for. So in some cases, that's true. Uh, for example, let's look at uh, this second row, second column. Right, where proline is. So second row, meaning it starts with C. Second column, meaning the second base is C. All the ones in this block have C, C. And then we go through every permutation of the third base, U, C, A, or G. And no matter what I put there, it still codes for proline. This is an example of our, our degeneracy, our redundancy in the code. Okay? And you probably have picked that out. You've noticed that some, most of these blocks, there's 16 of those blocks, a lot of them code for only one amino acid, like the block above it only codes for serine, this one for proline, this one for threonine, and the one on the bottom only for alanine. So it seems like only the first two bases really matter for a lot of these amino acids, and that's entirely true. But in some cases it's not. So this block here, so let's look at the, the fourth row, which starts with G, and the third column, which has an A in the second spot, so all four in this block have start with G, A. Okay, so fourth row, third column, this block all starts with G, A. Now it does matter what's in the last base, right? It's a, if it's a U or C, we get aspartic acid. If it's an A or G, we get glutamic acid. Okay? Those two are also very similar to each other. So it seems like similarities go together in this table too. Right? So what's the main reasoning behind U or G, A, U and G, A, C giving aspartate and G, A, A and G, A, G giving glutamate? Is there any distinction between those two in that block? What do you notice? Purines and pyrimidines. Purines versus pyrimidines, right. So if it's a, a pyrimidine in the third spot, it always codes for aspartate. If it's a purine in the third spot, doesn't matter which one, but as long as it's a purine, we get glutamic acid. And you see that patterns elsewhere too. It distinguishes serine from arginine in this uh, third row but fourth column block. And the one next to it, we distinguish asparagine from lysine, histidine from glutamine above it, and so forth. So it seems to pattern pyrimidine versus purines matter in that third block. But that's also not entirely true. If we look at this block over here, the third row and the first column that starts with AU in this entire block, it isn't broken down between purine and pyrimidine. Isoleucine is coded for by everything in that third position except G. And methionine is only coded for by G in the third position, with A, U, G. And that's our start codon. It also codes for every other methionine in the structure. So this is not a distinct uh, purine versus pyrimidine de de delineation there. So we'll, get over, we'll, we'll talk about how that works as well. And then of course we have our three stop codons. And in all of those cases, they start with U, right? And then there's a series of bases afterwards, right? A, 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 G, or G, A. And I'll show you how those patterns come up out as well. But what I want you to get out of this is how to use this table. You saw some patterns in it, but how do you use this table? These labels in here, these, these U's, C's, A's, and G's, represent the positions of codons. Not anticodons, but codons. Where are codons found? mRNA. mRNA. Where are the anticodons found? tRNA. tRNA. Let's, let's do an example here. Let's say I had the, 
the codon UUU, the very top first row, first column, UUU, and it codes for phenylalanine, right? And the tRNA that would pair with this would have what sequence in its anticodon? So it reads UUU and the codon. What would the anticodon read? AAA. AAA. And that's an easy question because you didn't have to consider directionality. Right? That's why you started with that one. What if you do the one below that and it's UUC? It would still code for phenylalanine. But what would the anticodon for that one read? GAA. GAA. When I'm asking you to read it to me, unless I say otherwise, I want you to read it five to three. I want you to, sh to, to speak it or say it five to three. All these are written five to three. So if I say the codon is UUC, give me its anticodon. Well, give me what it pairs with, but give it to me in the five to three direction. So it would read, it would read GAA. Okay. All right, so let's look at the, the thing at the bottom of the screen. I give you a small stretch of mRNA here. It could be in the middle of the sequence or something. And I ask you, what does this sequence code for? Right? How would you how would you approach this problem? What I would do is, if I had a, a pen, I would draw these into triplets, like the AAC that begins, draw a line after it, and you can do this on your exam. And then GUU, draw a line after it, and then CAA, draw a line there. And we'll look up each of these codons independently. And drawing the lines helps you keep track of without being overlapped. So AAC codes for what? We find the first base A, third row. Second base, A, third column, so we're in this block here. And then AAC, C is the second one in this block, and AAC codes for asparagine. I want you to give me the sequence of amino acids coded for in the one-letter combinations. So asparagine has what one-letter code? It's one of the odd ones with no rhyme or reason to it. N. N, right, it has the code N. So I would write down N. Now I look up the next one. G U U codes for what? So I find G U U. G U U codes for valine. So I wrote N and then I'd write V. V. And you guys do the next one. C A A codes for what? So C A A. Glutamine. Glutamine, which the code would be Q. Q. So I have N, right, V, Q, and you continue and keep going, right? You go through this whole thing. And I'll leave the rest of it for you to check. And I would write the sequence as N, V, Q, T, V, right? And that's the, the order of amino acids this thing would make. Which end of this N, V, Q, T, V is five prime and which end is three prime? Think about it again. Which end of this is the five prime end and which end is the three prime end? The left side's the There's end not side one, and the right there? C. All right, there are no fives and threes to this, correct? And the N would be the amino terminus and the last V would be the carboxy terminus. This is a protein, it's not a nucleic acid. So I led you down the road and you just followed me to the cliff and you, you know jumped off. But make sure you, anytime you're asked a question, critique the question, analyze the question. Is this even a valid question? Right? And, and if it isn't, that's an easy answer is you just point out the invalidity of the question. So it doesn't have five prime and three prime ends. You just tell me on the test like, hey, no such thing. This is the N terminus and this is the C terminus. Get it right. So I'd, be, I'd love that answer. Right? So look beyond just where I'm leading you and ask, you know, critique the question to start with. Judge the premise of the question first. And those are often easier if you do that. What's that? Does it not matter there, like, if you ask that same question on a test to give the sequence, wouldn't you look for the start sequence first, the AUG? If, if I asked you to find an AUG to start the thing, yes. But in this question, I said this occurs somewhere in the middle of a sequence, and I want you to continue it. Okay. But you're right. If I said start from the beginning, you would look for an AUG. 
Can you explain why um, the glutamine is represented as Q? Not really. I, I don't know the rhyme or reason behind the, the, the aspartate, glutamate, asparagine, and glutamine being D, E, N, and Q respectively. I just memorized them in that order a long time ago. Some of them make perfect sense, right? Valine is V, proline is P, serine S, and then, oh, what, what do I do with tyrosine? I already used T for threonine. Oh, let's go with Y. That's its next letter. Seems logical. But for some of them, it makes no sense whatsoever, right? There may have been a reason at some point why they chose it. I don't know the reasons. I just memorized them all those years ago. Where can we, like, find the abbreviations for each of them? Um, some of those those charts I put up on your slides have the one-letter coding next to these things. Uh, or just Google amino acids in your, like, a flashcard on your phone or computer. They're, they're listed everywhere. I'm sure it's in the cover of most biochem texts, the inside cover. But it's also on one of, one of these slides. So it's, it's very common to figure out these codes. Uh, just a few of them seem odd, right? I have some tricks for helping you remember them, and if you want, we can talk about it afterwards. Like tryptophan is the biggest amino acid, so it gets the widest letters, W, right? So the little tricks I learned, you know, like that was like 30-something years ago. But, you know, you, maybe not 30, but you, you memorize it by certain ways and you just, it sticks with you. Okay? So here's an example of starting from the beginning, like he was just talking about. If I give you an mRNA and start from the beginning, you'd find an AUG and that'll code for myelinating and so forth. But if I just give you a sequence and don't give you any, any reason to start at a certain base, you have three options on where to start. These are different reading frames. Okay, so this, you can start with AUG in this case, right? Or you can start with the U and read UGC, like in the second reading frame here. Or you can start with the G and read GCA, like in the third reading frame. However, if I move on to the next base and say CAU, I'm back in the first reading frame again. So because we're reading in triplets, there are only three possible reading frames in this direction. Okay, so make sure you know which reading frame we're in. Okay? And this brings up a point about mutations. If it's in this original mRNA, right, I decided to delete this middle U. Right? This U in the center is deleted. Maybe it was deleted back in the DNA. And when I make the mRNA here, it doesn't have this U anymore. What will that do as I'm reading this? I read A, U, G, C, A, then I would read G, because the U is missing. And then I would read C, A, U. So I've gone from reading in the first reading frame, but because this U is missing, I've shifted to the second reading frame. Right? So a mutation, like a deletion, or in fact an addition, would cause the same problem. I shift reading frames, which may make it into nonsense. And so addition and deletion mutations that are not in multiples of three could change the reading frame. And that could result in a nonsense product in protein. Okay. So here's some more examples of this code being not nearly universal, it was just close. So in our standard code, we said our, our stop codons were UAA and UGA and UAG, which I do want you to know those. And if you look at that standard code UGA stop codon, right, which is over here on the right in the green here, right, in the top right box, it says UGA, it's got a little star next to it to indicate it's a stop codon, right? If you look at that in a bacterial or, or some bacterial or a mitochondrial code, it's not a stop codon. It codes for tryptophan, just like the one UGG right below it. And that's more in line with how generally the, the blocks work in here. They generally occur in little small groupings. So UGG and UGA, both coding for tryptophan, seems normal. Whereas if it's a stop code on it, it seems kind of odd. Right? So it seems like the mitochondrial code is a little simpler, more rudimentary. And that's probably true because it's older. Okay? Some other weird things about it is uh, remember we only had one codon for methionine, the AUG, but if you look in the mitochondrial code and some bacterial codes, AUA is also mito or, uh, methionine, which makes sense again, it occurs in those purine versus pyrimidine blocks. Right? 
And then finally, the in bacteria, since they don't have, or in mitochondria, they don't have that UGA stop codon, it codes for tryptophan, they don't just have two stop codons, the UAA and UAG, that they have in common with us. They also have two more stop codons, the AGA and the AGG down here, which are normally arginines for us, they are stop codons in mitochondria. So you're thinking, well, how does mitochondria ever make arginine then? Well, arginine isn't limited to those two. There's an entire other block above it here of arginine codons. So there's in fact six arginine codons in the standard code. Just like there's six leucine codons right, over here on the left. Okay, so these are the main six changes between the standard code and the mitochondrial or some bacterial code. Okay? The other thing we have here listed are rare codons. Okay, so these are codons that are not often used. And I don't want you to memorize these numbers. I just want you to know these things exist. Because if you're going to take a human gene and express it in a bacterial cell, E. coli may not use the same predominant codons for, say, leucine that we do. And so, for example, in leucine, right, in E. coli here, leucine is very infrequently used the codon CUA. So if you look at CUA here, it's one of my six I boxed in red for you. It's only used 5% of the time for leucine, whereas CUG is used 46% of the time. The others are in the, the low teens percentages, but not nearly as low as the CUA. CUA is rarely used as the codon for leucine. It would much prefer to use CUG. So if you have a human gene, that you try to express in bacteria, there's a lot of CUA leucines, which we may use often, the E. coli is going to have a tough time making that protein because it's not used to using that codon. In other words, the anticodon, the tRNA used for that, is not abundant. Okay, so you got to be aware of rare codons. In particular, you got to watch out for those AGAs and AGGs because they're only used 2 or 3% of the time, respectively. And if you try to express this in a a mitochondrial or a different kind of bacteria, you may not get any useful protein at all because those are going to be stop codons. And that's not going to result in a, a full-length protein at all. Okay. all. right. So what I want you to know from that chart is if you look at our standard code again and I replace these changes, you notice things become more in line with our, our view of having it in blocks of two. Methionine would be both of those. Tryptophan would be both of those blocked in red. And the two arginines down below wouldn't be arginine because we don't need them. There'll be two more stop codons. And everybody's happy with blocks of two. So it's a more rudimentary or basic code than the standard code we have in our cells or in our, our nuclei. All right, so let's move on to tRNA. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the fact that like we have six codons that code for leucine, does that point to us like using leucine more than other amino acids? Leucine is a very commonly used amino acid, that's true. But the number of possible codons, the, the degree of degeneracy, doesn't correlate across the board with how frequently that amino acid appears in protein. It does for some of them, but not all of them. In fact, aspartate and glutamate are very common amino acids, but again, they only have two codons. And if you want to really take it to the extreme, Almost all of our proteins begin with methionine, and there's only one codon for it. So it's not necessarily correlating with, with abundance to frequency of use or number of codons. So don't make that assumption. But it's a good pattern to point out, and I'm sure someone else has had that question before. You're absolutely great for pointing that out, and they've tested it, and it's not necessarily the case. So great question. It has been asked and answered. Okay. So let's move on to tRNA. And I want to remind you uh, what we talked about last, not last lecture, but a while ago, and that we had our tRNA getting ready at the top. We had our tRNA processing we did. Remember at the top here, we had that clover leaf, like roadkill diagram. It didn't start out life that way. We did some trimming. I took the same picture from the other slide here. We took some trimming on the five prime end, we did some trimming on the three prime end, and we put back CCA, right? This is of course eukaryotic now. And then we tagged some bases with methyl groups, we made some pseudouridines, we cut out an intron, and then we had our mature tRNA ready to go. Okay, so just to remind you of all that, I'm gonna put that into my analogy here. 
And this is my, my second favorite analogy. We'll get to the, my favorite one later when we do enzymes. But this one, it's, it's a story that started as a, an explanation in class one day and turned into many discussions in office hours. And it, it just evolved from there and people have liked it ever since. And we keep adding to it. So this is, it's a, a movie or a play, and you can think of it, it's got several scenes. We're gonna start out with scene one. And in scene one, uh, oh, they named the play, it's called, uh, what did the students name it? It's called Cytoplasm the Movie, uh, or Cell the Movie or something like that, some silly name. Uh, so anyway, in scene one of this movie or play, uh, we're gonna start out at a hotel, okay? So you're at the hotel, and the goal here is you're gonna try to get a series of hats on a plane at the airport. Okay, so you live in this little town called the Cell, right? And it's it's a very weird town. Um, so you're at the hotel. You're staying at the hotel, and, and so the next day your your goal is to get your hat on a plane. That's a very odd thing to do, but there's a lot of odd things in this analogy. Um, and I like choosing the analogy such that every part has a, a, a correspondence to reality. I want it to make sense in what's really going on, not some analogy for for cleverness sake just I want parts to make sense so if you think of something unusual there's a reason for it so you're at the hotel and you go to your you are the tRNA molecule you were just born right you were just synthesized at the hotel for some reason that's where you were born right so the hotel being the nucleus and so you you need to go visit the barber the hotel barber so you, you go down to the barber and we're gonna have to assume this is a a male, for instance, because we need a beard for this analogy. Not that women can't have beards, but they're less likely. But let's assume it's a guy who has a robust beard when he's born. It's a very weird baby, right? But we need to get some, some trimming done, right? You grew up really fast and you have this full beard. So we need to go to the hotel and you're going to get your beard trimmed. That's this green five prime nucleotides being removed. We need to trim up that, that shaggy beard, right? So we trim it down until it looks nice. Right? We got it nice and base period. We lose all the green nucleotides up there. Your beard is set. Okay? Then we'll work on the top of your head. We need to trim off anything on the three prime end, which is the top of your head, and get all that taken care of and squared away so you have just a, an A left there. Right? We talked about the, what gets cut off earlier. Then the barber realizes that, hey, your, your hair is kind of thinning out there. It's a weird person. He's just born. So we need to put in some, some extensions in your hair. Right? So we're going to put some extensions in there. They're always the same ones. He only has one stock available. He puts CCA every time. Okay, so you may have a different shaped face. You may have a different eyes. Your neck might be longer than other people. And you're wearing all sorts of different clothing. But everybody has the same hair extensions. It always reads CCA on top of your head. Okay, And to the A on the end of your CCA is where your hat attaches. Right, it's always That's the only way you can put a hat on. Right. So you leave the barber shop, you go on to another uh, area of the hotel where they're going to tailor your clothes, right? You got to get your clothes ready now. So you got to look sharp going to the airport. So thus the, the link to the song there. So you got you to get your clothes tailored. So you need to get your cuff links done. You got to have your tie put on straight. Your, your jacket has to be tailored and matched and so forth. So this is all the modifications to our loops, our pseudouridines and our, our methyl guanines and so forth. We got to get all matching just right. And you have some supervisor there checking you out, going, yes, it's looking good. Your coat fits, your, your, your tie's on straight, and everything else, your pants now fit. But he notices that your pants are way too long for you. They're like two feet too long. We need to get that trimmed up. But they're not going to do that until everything else is set. So everything else is set for you. Now we'll hem your pants, and that's removing that intron at the bottom so we can make the anti codon loop and finally reveal your shoes. Right? You had your shoes on the whole time, we just couldn't see them. So we, we, we hemmed your pants, and now the shoes are revealed, and we, we see them and we go, hey, you're wearing dress shoes, like really nice, shiny dress shoes. And you're ready to go out the door. On your way out the door, there's uh, one person standing at the door, we'll call him the, the concierge desk or something, and his job is to give you your hat. Okay? That person in our story is playing the role of the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Okay, that's the enzyme that puts the amino acids on the tRNAs. And this concierge, we're going to assume he's French. He's very, very particular. He does not make mistakes. Okay? So he says, your hat must match your shoes. Right? You have to look sharp. You will not accept anything sub-quality. Your hat must match your shoes. So in his case, 
he sees your, your very fancy, shiny dress shoes, and he attaches a top hat to your head. Right? Very fancy ball you're going to, apparently. So, so if you had a different pair of shoes on, let's say you had some sandals on, he's like, top hat is not for you. He's going to give you, let's say, a sombrero right, you're going to wear with your, your, your sandals. Or you're wearing some tennis shoes, and now he's going to go, oh, you deserve the, the baseball cap. Right? So the hat must match the shoes. I'm running out of options here because I'm not that good in, in, in clothing you know, nomenclature. So I have to ask someone else better versed in, in styling. But you get the idea that your hat must match your shoes. And he never, ever makes mistakes. Okay? This is the definition of the genetic code. So that concierge putting your hat or the amino acid on your head, the three prime end of your tRNA where the CCA is, to match the anticodon at the other side ensures that that anticodon is now associated with that amino acid. Right? So this is the basis of the genetic code. The ribosome does not create the genetic code. All it does is decode it. Right? It reads the code later. The amino acyl tRNA synthetases, these concierges at the desk, the ones that are making sure the right amino acid goes with the right anticodon on the tRNA, encode the genetic code. They're the ones that make the code possible. Okay. Everybody got the distinction on those? The amino acyl tRNA synthetases encode the genetic code. They make it. They create it. The ribosome simply has a decoder ring, right? It decodes it and just follows instructions. Okay. By codon to anticodon, and the ribosome will put on whatever amino acids on the other end. So if our concierge happens to make a mistake, which they rarely do, but if they do, the ribosome won't know any better. Right? It just follows instructions. Okay, so that's our, our scene one at the hotel. You're getting ready to go. We got you tailored, we got your clothes done, we got your shoes shown so we can get the right hat and out the door. Okay? That's our first scene. Okay? So some of those modifications, like we said, were our, our pseudouridines, we have our methyl cytosines, methyl guanines. Inosine is a very unusual base. This is quite different from the four you're used to. So, so Dr. Mary Pyle called this the, the roadkill diagram on the left, and it really doesn't look like this. It looks more, more L-shaped in reality. But on the, the right here, at the top, you see a, a base called inosine. Now, if you had to classify inosine, would you put it in the purine or pyrimidine category? Purine. Purine, right? I see two rings. Uh, each ring has two nitrogens. That fits my rule for purines. So purine, definitely it is. And then I had to ask, is it an A or a G? And I remember A does not have any oxygens, right? And G specifically had one oxygen. But I also remember that adenine had exactly five nitrogens. And this one is missing the nitrogen that belongs there. It should be a nitrogen pointing off down over here on the left. So it's not really an A, it's not really a G, it's kind of a hybrid of the two. So we call it inosine. And in fact, it's the precursor to making both A and G in their synthesis. We just stopped at this point in the assembly line. All right, so inosine has some interesting qualities, right? And we'll see what those are. It can pair with things that A's and G's don't normally do. Okay? So let's look at our, our codon-anticodon interaction here. So the anticodon, which is on the tRNA, right, at the top here, if I were to read it, 5 to 3 would read C-A-U. And the codon on the mRNA, the message that we're reading, would read A-U-G. And you see those base pair fairly well, right? The A to the U, the U to the A, and the G to the C. Right? And that's exactly how they interact with each other. So we know every single one can't be that way. We don't have 64 different, or 61, different tRNAs, right? There's only roughly 20 of them. So how can you possibly have the same anticodon recognize, in some cases, four different codons? How is that possible? So one of these must not base pair very well, and it's the third base pair we see here, right? And this is what they termed the wobble base. I, don't really like the name wobble because it sounds like it's it's moving around. That's not what it means. It means it has more a more promiscuous ability to bind with other bases, right? So it's a base that binds with more than one other base, 
we're used to AU or AT and GC and no others, right? And we said occasionally in RNA we can get a GU pair, and that's totally true. But then for the wobble, we're going to get some weird pairings, and we'll talk about those in a second. And inosine is going to be responsible. Okay? So the wobble pair in this diagram at the top is not the first pairing, not the second pairing, but the third one. So be careful how you say that. So the wobble base is the third or last base in the codon. However, it's the first base in the anticodon because we reference it 5 to 3. So the wobble pair is between the last base of the codon and the first base of the anticodon. Okay, so don't think it's the first base of the anticodon because that's, or sorry, the third base of the anticodon because that's over here. Okay, so how does this work? Well, in the codon at the top right here, the AUG, you know codes for methionine and only methionine and is the only codon for methionine. So this is a very strict relationship. Right? So this GC, you see, is not a wobble pair. It's very strict. Only C will pair with this G, nothing else. But in other cases, if I have AU something other than G, and if you look back at your code, you don't have to memorize these, but that would be isoleucine. So AUC, AUA, and AUU all code for isoleucine. But AUG was the unique one for methionine. How can we possibly have an anticodon that would recognize any of those other three? So I'm looking for something that reads A in the codon, A, U, anything but G here. What would that pair with? I need one thing here that would recognize anything but G and then A, U in the anticodon. How do we do that? Well, here's how inosine works. I would put inosine there. So if reading this chart below, make sure you keep track of which side you're on. So if the first base of the anticodon, right, first base of the anticodon, the thing at the top, the five prime end of the anticodon, that's what first base means, is a C, like shown here, it will only pair with G, nothing else. It's very strict. If the first base of the anticodon determines what it will pair with. So if it's a C, it must be a G. And that occurs for methionine. That's the example of that. Okay. If the first base up here, I don't mean this one, I mean this position again. If this read UAA, right? If this first base up here was an A, it will pair exclusively with U. Okay. And that's it. So those two are very strict. If the first base of the anticodon is C, it will only pair with G. If the first base is A, it will only pair with U. Now things get weird. If the first base up here is a U, and we remember from RNA, other lectures, that sometimes U will pair with G, and other times it'll pair with A. So if the first base up here is a U, then this bottom one could be any purine, A or G, right? If the top up here is a G, you also remember Gs can pair with U or C, right? So if the top base is a G, it can pair with U or C or any pyrimidine down here. Well, that, those two facts alone should give you a clue on why the code is broken up into those two codon blocks. Remember we said purine versus pyrimidine in a lot of those blocks. And that's because it puts either a U or a G here. And it can detect the purine or pyrimidine. And that way, one tRNA with its anticodon, with its U or G here at the top, can detect a pair of codons, right? So how do we get the, the weird one with methionine versus isoleucine with three? And that's where inosine comes in. Inosine is placed here in the anticodon, never in the codon. And the anticodon has an inosine in the first spot, then it can pair with anything but G, as you see on the bottom. Well, that's convenient, because if it's AUG, I know this is the one that codes for methionine. And since that's a C here, it must pair only with G by our first line, and that will definitely give me methionine. But if inosine is up here, it will not pair with G, but any other base here, AUU, AUA, AUC, will pair with the inosine. So the anticodon of the tRNA that has isoleucine on it, also convenient, that's the I one, has inosine in its first spot. So inosine goes with isoleucine. Right, it's easy to remember. 
And that's how we get that split from one versus the other three, as opposed to the ones that are broken up into blocks of two, they have U's and G's in that first base of the anticodon. So the first base of the anticodon is what determines the third base of the codon to which it will bind, not the other way around. Okay, so keep that chart straight. Okay, so how does this thing work? It's, is it accurate? Is it fast? Sure, it's fairly fast and it, it does make mistakes, right? If we make a mistake here in putting the proteins together, we're talking about at the ribosome now, it makes a mistake of codon, anticodon binding. I don't mean back and putting your, your hat on, right? I mean at the ribosome decoding this thing. It makes a mistake fairly often, right? As far as we're comparing it to say DNA synthesis, which is virtually never making a mistake. But let's say we make a mistake. This frequency here says 10 to the minus two. It means I make a mistake about 1% of the time. 10 to the minus two being one out of 100, right? That does not mean that I make a mistake every 100 bases. This is a probability, a frequency. You have a 1% chance of making a mistake at every amino acid you put on. It doesn't mean you make one exactly every 100. That's statistics, that's how this works. So what this chart is expressing is if I make a mistake out of 1% chance every base I put on, and I make an amino acid that's 100 amino acids long, what's the chance that I will make that protein error-free? Apparently we can't spell free. I think that might be an internal pun, right? I don't know if it is or not, but you know, there's an error there. So what's the chance of making a 100 amino acid protein without a mistake? About 36, 37% of the time. That's not good enough. That means you're making two out of every three proteins with problems. That's not gonna be compatible with life. So our frequency of inserting a correct one has to be better than this. So let's move on to one out of every thousand, 10 to the minus three. Now we'll make that amino acid sequence of 100 error-free about 90 to 91% of the time. That's still not compatible with life. That means you're making a mistake. I mean, you're making an A at this point, but it's not good enough. If you're making a mistake one out of 10 times. So you're wasting a lot of resources. So we need to get better than that. So let's do 10 to the minus four. We make a mistake on average, one out of every 10,000 times we put a base in, put an amino acid in. That'll make an error-free protein of this length 99% of the time. That's acceptable. I'm willing to lose 1%, okay? But if you're a eukaryotic organism, right, your protein sequences aren't this short, right? They're not 100 bases long. They're closer to 1,000 bases long. Some of them around 300, but most of them around 300 to 1,000 bases long. And in that rate, you're at 97 or even down to, say, 90 or 91. Again, that's not compatible. So in eukaryotes, our ribosomes have to be even more efficient, right? So or more high fidelity. So we make a mistake about once every 100,000 bases, 10 to the minus 5. Now we make it 99% of the time unless it's a really long protein, and that's compatible with life. Okay, okay so back to our story, right? So we're back at scene one at the hotel again, when we re rehash where we were. You were a tRNA, you had your beard trimmed, you had your hair cut, you had the extensions put in your hair, you got your cuff links or your tie and your coat and everything ready, and we trimmed those really long pants to get rid of that one intron down there, and we can see your shoes now. And the guy at the door gave you the correct hat for your shoes, okay? So we're going to put the right amino acid on the tRNA. This is done by the concierge, right? And his name is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. The name tells you what it does. It synthesizes or puts together amino acids. Amino acyl is the adjective form of the word amino acid. That's all that means. Like methyl is the adjective of methane. So it's an amino acid and a tRNA, and we're gonna put them together. That's his job, okay? But we have to do it correctly, okay? So here's how he does it. The first thing we need to do is get our amino acid willing, or our hat, willing to go in your head, right? It doesn't wanna go on the head. It's an amino acid. It's very soluble, floating around. It's got some charges, because it's a zwitterion in solution. And the end of this tRNA is got a phosphate on it, right? It's negatively charged. It's, doesn't want to be anywhere near this thing, all right? Two negative charges don't want to get together. We have to talk it into it. So the way we do that is we take the amino acid and we take an ATP sitting in solution. Remember, we're not going to 
visualize ATP as a glowing ball of energy in this class. It's an actual molecule, right? It's got an adenine, it's got a ribose, and three, one, two, three phosphates, okay? What happens is the carboxyl group of our amino acid, shown in blue here, right? They're already attached in this picture, but the carboxyl group attacks the first phosphate and the latter two phosphates leave. This is very similar to the way we did RNA synthesis. So now I've attached my amino acid to the AMP that's left over, right? We lost two phosphates. So I have an amino acid attached to AMP, and this is not a stable arrangement. Can anybody tell me why this is not stable? We did it on purpose. Think back to what we talked about the first day. What, what about this is not stable? So do you see this double bond or carbonyl here? And then I have two single bonds. And then one of these is another double bond, right? Much like a carbonyl, but it's with a phosphate. So I have two double bonds, one being a, a keto group, separated by two single bonds. This is a beta keto arrangement. And beta ketos are not stable. Alpha ketos, very stable. Beta ketos, not stable. So that's why we had to lose the other two phosphates. This was energetically feasible because of the loss of the two phosphates and the degradation by pyrophosphatase. So I had to spend, if you think of it in terms of currency, an ATP. But effectively, I had to spend two ATP equivalents. And why do I say two ATP equivalents? I mean, the resultant product when I'm done here will be an AMP that's left over. But I cut off two high-energy phosphates. So I think of it not as spending... If you think of ATP as a, a currency in a cell, they use that term a lot. It's the currency of the cell. Well, it's in currencies of the, the base unit is high energy phosphates. So I didn't spend two dollars of phosphate. I used an ATP debit card and charged it twice. Right. So I have an ATP debit card and I charged it twice from the same molecule. I cut off two phosphates. So that's why I call this equivalent of two ATPs in terms of energy, okay? So if I cut that off, this beta keto arrangement over here is unstable. It doesn't want to stay like that. So we allow it to resolve. We don't want this just to fall off. We're gonna take advantage of it. So this enzyme puts the amino acid on the, the ATP temporarily. So basically, if you go back to our analogy, I took your amino acid, which is your top hat in this case, and squirted some super glue in it, right? Well, super glue is a not, I don't want to use that to bad analogy. How about some Elmer's glue? It's not permanent. It's just some, some temporary glue. I squirted some glue in there, right? Uh, and then I take it over to your head, which is the end of the tRNA. Remember, I flipped it upside down here, so you're standing on your head in this picture. So the end of the tRNA, the three prime end, was C, C, A. This was the extension I put on your head. And this is where I'm going to attach the amino acid. So this Elmer's glued hat, right, a wood glue hat, comes over here. And instead of in this arrangement, because it's unstable, the three prime OH for most of the tRNAs, for about half of them, it's the two prime that does it. But we'll stick to the three prime. The three prime OH is free, and it attacks this carbonyl. Okay? A nucleophile attacking a carbonyl is one of the most common reactions we're going to see. And when it does attack it, this goes up and forms an O minus, a tetrahedral carbon, collapses back to a carbonyl. You've seen this a thousand times in the organic chemistry and the AMP is the leaving group. So our AMP molecule leaves, it's a great leaving group. And now I've attached my amino acid by this wood glue to the top of your head, right? What kind of bond, what kind of attachment is my wood glue? How is your amino acid attached to your tRNA? By what bond? Covalent bond. It, it is a covalent bond. Be more specific. So what is, what is this bond shown down here between this amino acid in blue and this ribose in black? Amino bond? There's no nitrogen in this bond. 
falsehood as to? There is no phosphorus in this bond. There's no phosphate left. It's gone. This is a phosphodiester between the C and the A, yes. But between the last sugar and the amino acid, there's no phosphorus. It's simple. It's just an ester. Bond. Exactly. It's just an ester bond. So are ester bonds easy to break? What was the question? Are ester bonds relatively easy to break? Um, yeah. Yes. Compared to, say, amide bonds, yes, they're very easy to break. So what would it take to break this ester bond? Think back to some of your organic labs. You made some esters in lab. And what were you absolutely certain you had to do before you started? Because you were using Make sure the glassware was dry. Make sure it was dry. We don't want to get this wet. So if you get this wet, it's very likely, if you could get a water molecule in there, it's likely to break this bond. So you just got dressed at the hotel, we put your hat on, and we need to get you to the airport. Unfortunately, in the cytoplasm, it is always raining. I mean, that's, that's a silly way of saying it, but it's, it's completely underwater, right? So in this made up fictional town, it's always a torrential downpour, right? There's water everywhere. So how do we keep this from getting wet? We have to protect it. The moment you leave the hotel, you're gonna get wet and lose your hat. This glue will not suffice under water conditions. So we put your hat on, we need to protect it. Okay. But let's go back to the concierge and look at how, he, how he's so good at his job. Okay. So here's an example of a three anneal tRNA synthetase. And its job is to put threonine on the appropriate tRNA for threonine. Right, with the right anticodon and everything else. Okay? So how is he able to look at you and tell your shoes, maybe you're wearing three different types of dress shoes, and they're very, very similar, and only a connoisseur of dress shoes would know the difference. And that's kind of what he has to decide. And he needs to pick which hat goes with which shoe, and it's exceedingly difficult. And in fact, it's almost impossible. And here's what I mean by that. If you look at these amino acids on the right, Threonine, serine, and valine almost look exactly the same. So can somebody tell me the difference between threonine, serine, and valine? What stands out if you had to choose among these? How could you pick them apart? What feature would you uh, look for? Presence of methyl group. Presence of a methyl group, good. But three, excuse me, threonine and valine both have methyl groups. Yeah, but, uh, that, that's, that's not a wrong answer, you're right. But what else would you look for? That's not sufficient. Hydroxyl group. Okay, a hydroxy group, but threonine and serine also have hydroxy groups, so still not by itself sufficient. Both the methyl and the hydroxy? If we could look for both, you're right, that would be ideal. How would you look for or detect a hydroxy group? If you are this concierge, you're the, the amino acyl tyranny synthetase for threonine, how do you detect a hydroxy group? The uh, hint, look at the figure at the bottom, it'll help you figure it out. So I'll, I'll, I'll orient you at the bottom. So We're this is the, everything in blue here is the concierge, is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, right? It's made of amino acids, he's a protein, right? So the three you need here is shown not in blue and the, the alpha carbon's definitely right here in the center the amino group on its right binding to a zinc ion that holds it there because of the charge, right? And then the carboxyl group is shown above, which all amino acids have that, so that can't be how it detects it. It must be its R group. See, so R group goes down to the bottom left, where here's the beta carbon, here's the methyl, and here's the OH right there, right? So how is the, the concierge, the amino acyl tRNA synthetase for threonine, detecting that hydroxy group? Hydrogen bonds? It's hydrogen bonding with? Uh, asparagine in that picture, I think. Aspartate, right? Aspartate. Those are both oxygens. So, so it's going to be an aspartate or an aspartic acid, depending on the protonation state, but likely aspartate. So it's hydrogen bonding with the OH, right, group. Would valine be able to accomplish this interaction? No. So no. 
no, you're right. In this figure, this OH you're looking at would be another one of these methyl groups. And methyls don't interact very well with aspartates because they don't hydrogen bond. So I can easily preclude valine from fitting well, right? Like, get out of here, you don't belong. Valine may try to fit, and it does. It'll, it'll try to get in there. But the concierge is like, nah, that's not the right hat. Don't hand me that. That's the wrong thing. It's assistance getting it wrong. Don't hand me that, right? Can it tell threonine from serine? Would the serine qualify for that interaction? I would think so. It has an OH in exactly the same spot. But what does serine lack? The methyl. methyl. Lacks the methyl group. Are we really detecting a methyl group here? No. Not really. It's filling a little hydrophobic pocket there. But remember, hydrophobic interactions are exceedingly weak and low in energy. So the difference here is too small to detect, right? So it's how would you how would you prevent, let's say, um, tyrosine from fitting in here? It's also got an OH. How would you prevent tyrosine from fitting? It's also an alcohol. Make the pocket smaller. Well, we don't have to make it smaller. The pocket's a certain size. And tyrosine just won't fit. My tyrosine is huge, right? It just won't fit in this pocket. So overall, these concierge or, or the, the three anil, or I'm sorry, not three anil, but amino acyl in general, tRNA synthetases can easily preclude the binding of something too big for the pocket, but they can't stop something from too small from fitting, like our serine. You see how it's just basically a smaller version of three anil minus a methyl group. So this thing can't tell the difference between threonine and serine. Valine's excluded because it can't make right, the, can't give you the right handshake with that hydrogen bond. But serine is not precluded. It can get in there, and it will put serine on by mistake. He cannot tell the difference. But wait a minute. You told me a few minutes ago that they don't make mistakes. So how is this possible? Are you contradicting yourself? Almost. The, the, the three anil tRNA synthetase will put threonine on if it jumps in there. It will not put valine on. It can tell the difference. And it will put serine on by mistake. That's an error, right? It's the wrong amino acid on the threonine's tRNA. But we have a plan for that, right? It would be very difficult to prevent serine from getting in the active site because it's simply just smaller than threonine and the interactions are minuscule difference. So what it does is it allows it to put it on, okay? Now let me think, let you think about another scenario real quick and see if you can see how this came about. What if you were a different concierge and your job was to put serine on its tRNA? Do you think its pocket looks the same as this? Or do you think its pocket might have a, a bigger piece in the way to prevent threonine from fitting? Everybody understand the question? If you might have a smaller pocket to prevent that, that you can methyl from exactly. Getting. You can always prevent larger things from getting in, but you can't stop something smaller from getting in. Does that make sense? So the the serial tRNA synthetase will only put serine on, nothing else, because nothing is like serine and smaller. Threonine looks like it. It's just too big. The methyl group doesn't fit. So its pocket, instead of having an alanine here with its methyl group and this threonine's methyl group, might say have a phenylalanine here as part of its core structure. And that prevents this methyl group from even getting in there. I don't know if that's the exact mutation, but you get the idea. There's a bigger group here to make the pocket smaller so that threonine just don't fit. It just doesn't fit. Right? So let's use that. My threonyl tRNA synthesis says, okay, I see how serine is doing his job over there. I'm going to make a clone of serine and attach him to myself. It's not going to be an active site that puts things on, but it's going to be an active site that checks my work. So you have an active site there shown in yellow that puts threonine on appropriately, but it will make the erroneous choice of putting serine on too. It can't tell the difference. But if it puts threonine on, it will not fit in its editing, editing site, which is a clone of the serine's site. Does that make sense? It looks like the serial tRNA's site. It doesn't work the same way. It works reverse. If something fits in it, it cuts it off. 
So if you put 3D on appropriately, it will not fit in the editing site and you let it go and you did your job. However, if you put serine on by mistake, there is no way to know you made that mistake, but it will now fit in the editing site, whereas the 3 and one put on would not. We've kind of repurposed the other enzyme's selectivity. So if you put serine on by mistake, it'll flip over into the editing site because it fits, cut it off and say, try again. If you put serine on 10 times in a row, it'll keep cutting it off. Yes, that's getting expensive because I waste two ATP equivalents every time I make that mistake because I gotta put another amino acid on. But eventually we'll get it right and it'll release it with the 3 on it. So the way this 3 anyl tRNA synthetase has approached this problem is not try to get it right, but put it on, I accept that I might make a mistake, and if I do, fix my mistake. So it's a fix the problem after the fact, or ask for forgiveness instead of permission. If that helps you remember. That's how this thing works. Okay? So if you look on the right, um, the, all the parts of the tRNA molecule, that's you leaving the hotel, this, where you see yellow circles, is where the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, this is the concierge again, where he checks you out to make sure you are correct. And it basically touches every piece of clothing stitch you have on you to make sure it's right. It checks almost every base pair. If you didn't turn one into a, a methyl guanine somewhere, it'll notice. So these are very, very specific. But you notice the parts it makes the most contacts with are the anticodon loop at the bottom and the stem loop that ends at the top, which where, where the termini are. It makes a lot of contacts in those, and they determine what hat or what amino acid you're going to get. So your hat has to match your shoes. Okay. Okay. On to scene two. Let's move away from the hotel real quick. Let's go to the airport. This is where you're going to drop off your hat later. But the airport is like much like Atlanta all the time is not yet finished. It's still under construction, perpetually under construction, right? So we have a, a large subunit, a 50S. We have a small subunit, the 30S. I'm referring to the, the prokaryotic ones here, but the, the eukaryotic ones would be the 60 and the 40S. And they come together to make the 70S or the eukaryotic one would be called 80S. And that would be our functional airport. So the, the way this will work is we need to assemble this with lots of parts. So we need our mRNA to show up. We need our tRNAs to show up one at a time, and we need our large and small subunits to come together. Okay. So we need to build the airport. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is start putting it together. Okay. So we need to take our mRNA, which is our instructions, and they show up at the airport. We lay it down, right, like, like the sidewalk. Right. We lay them down a sidewalk, and on the sidewalk stand a whole bunch of people, and they're all carrying shoeboxes. Okay. You'll understand why it's a shoebox in a little bit. But they're all carrying shoebox, and each shoebox represents a codon. Okay, and what will fit in a shoebox? Well, it's not a traditional shoebox. It's it's like a shoebox that has a concrete mold of your shoe, and only certain shoes will fit. Right. So the shoe is representing your anti-codon, whereas the shoe box is the codon. Okay. Remember, you put your shoes on earlier. Right. But, so your head is where you attach the amino acid. That's the the three prime end of the thing. And then the opposite end of the tRNA where that anticodon loop is, that's your shoes, the anticodon. Okay, so codon is in the shoe box, the anticodon is are your shoes. Okay. So we lay down that strip of sidewalk, it's a moving sidewalk, you know, those ones at the airport that can slide. And it's a bunch of people standing there like you see at the airport with signs, except they're holding uh, molds of your shoes and shoe boxes. Okay. So now we're ready for you to try to get to the airport. So we built the airport, it's a very short scene of building the airport. We'll do more detail of how you get there. We need to get you from the hotel to the airport. So we need to do initiation, get this thing started, elongation, we need to build this hat chain that's gonna take off on a plane. And then we eventually, we need to terminate adding hats to this chain and have the plane leave with their hats, okay? So here's the assembly. We have a, a small subunit at the bottom, a large subunit at the top, and it has room in it for three tRNAs, or three of you, right, or three people like you who are getting ready at various hotels or, or same hotel perhaps, but they're all going to go to the airport. Okay? So the way this works is you remember a tRNA has an L shape in three dimensions, and that's shown here. There's three of them here. The exit site one's easy to see. It's kind of face on to you. It's an L shape. The P site one's more rotated, so it's pointing into the board here. 
And the A site one is pointed almost directly into the board. It's an L shaped like this. Okay. You notice the mRNA doesn't run directly through here like you see in a lot of diagrams, and I'll also use one that shows that. It doesn't run straight across. It kind of winds its way through the small subunit, right? Making contacts with the anticodons in the A site, the P site, but not the E site. It dips down and avoids this site. Okay, so we have some contacts here, some contacts here, and it avoids the one here. This is what we call the first site, the A site, or the amino acyl site, because this tRNA will show up with an amino acid on it. The P site is called a peptidyl site, because that's where it has the other amino acids, the hat chain that's been assembled together. And then E for exit site, this thing contains no more amino acids, it's just waiting to fall out the back of the ribosome. It doesn't really do much over here. Okay. So here's that diagram I was talking about where they show the mRNA being straight. It's not truly straight. It kind of dips away from the E site. But fortunately, they did show that there's no connections between the, the tRNA here and the, oops, and the mRNA there. Okay? All right. And as this mRNA is moving along and the tRNAs move along with it, we keep building these amino acids on each other, and they come out the tailpipe of the back of the airport on our airplane example as a string of hats put together. Okay, so let's move on to the, the scene of how we get this thing ready to go. So the mRNA has to lay down on this platform, right? Where do we line up? Well, we know we want to start with an AUG. And much like our uh, transcription and much like our DNA replication, we got to find that AUG. And the information for finding it is going to be upstream from it, right? So right upstream from it is going to be a region, right, that pairs with a region of the 30S subunit. So what I'm pointing to here is a, a section of mRNA before the AUG start codon, right, that pairs with the RNA of the small subunit. Remember, this is rRNA. This is gonna be our, our 18S rRNA that's part of the small 30S subunit, okay? So the rRNA that it's pairing with is called the shine delgarno sequence, right? And it matches, right, this sequence here, okay? So this sequence, sometimes also called the shine garner sequence because it pairs with the complementary one. You can refer to either one, it's, it's the pairing, is where it knows to line up. And when it lines up with that of the, the small subunit, it always positions this AUG directly in the P site, not the A, in the P site. This will be the only time that a codon begins in the P site. Every other codon we're gonna talk about starts in the A site. Okay. Only the start codon starts in the P site. Okay. So this AUG will be in the P site. And of course, the next codon, the GAA in this example, or down here, the GAA, will be in the A site. Okay. So always put this AUG in the P site. So if I take an mRNA from E. coli, for example, and I extracted it from the cell, and I gave it to a human cell, right? would it be able to line this up? Of course not. Our 16S rRNA looks completely different on that end than E. coli's. So what it's looking for to pair with this does not exist for ours. Ours is a slightly different sequence here. So mRNAs from one organism will not work for a different organism's ribosomes. So clearly the, the mRNAs, Shine-Delgarno sequences up here, co-evolved with their ribosomes 16S rRNA sequences. Right? So if I pluck it out of one organism, give it to another, it generally won't work. Even within the same organism, you see E. coli has different ones here. So these are different ones that go to slightly different organizations of the ribosome with its protein, so it knows which one to make. So there's more complexity than we're going over. But if I want to take an E. coli protein or a human gene and give it to E. coli, I'm going to have to change the beginning of this so it works with the E. coli system. So I can take 16S rRNAs, from various organisms and compare them and see how far those organisms have diverged in evolution. And that's generally the way we do it now because without the 16S rRNA, you don't function. You don't have a ribosome, you don't exist, you won't live. So it's very difficult to change that without correspondingly changing all your mRNAs that it uses. So it's difficult to change overall. Okay, okay so how do we start? The first codon, AUG, is going to code for methionine, except in bacteria it codes for what's called formal methionine, or FMET. 
okay? And it's methionine, here's your normal methionine, and on the amino terminus of the methionine, we put a formal group, right, which is an aldehyde, okay? Only in bacteria do we do this, in eukaryotes we don't do this, but we put the formal group on, and it knows this is the methionine I use for starting the protein, not as a methionine elsewhere in the protein, but this one's only for starting. In eukaryotes, we don't do that. We just use regular methionine, okay? Also in bacteria, when we put on this formal methionine, and then we put on whatever the next amino acid is, amino acid number two, let's call it, then number three, number four, number five, until we get all the way done. And when that protein is finally made, the bacteria will come along and cut off the entire formal methionine. It breaks that, the peptide bond cuts the whole thing off, right? So it breaks this bond right here, and the whole formal methionine will be gone. So in the mature protein, the first amino acid will be whatever it was coded for after that first methionine. So kind of everybody got promoted, if you think of it. Eukaryotes do not do this. We leave the methionine on. We don't use formal methionine, and we don't cut our methionine off. That's the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes there. So know that difference. Okay, okay we almost got our airport assembled. Let's finish. We have our 30S subunit represented by this little uh, oblong shape. The mRNA lines up with the shine delgarno sequence binding partner. The F-met, in this case, or in eukaryotes, regular old methionine. tRNA, with its methionine, or F-methionine bound to it, attaches to the codon in that site. So we have anti-codon and codon pairing, very specific. Remember, AUG and CAU. Then we have some initiation factors. These are proteins that come along and help this thing assemble. They're called IFs for initiation factor. Remember, we had transcription factors back in transcription. We made RNA. So we have initiation factors, IF1, IF2, and IF3. The role of each of these, let's run down on very simple. The role of IF1 is to sit in the A site so no tRNA will get in there. Okay? The role of IF3 is to sit in the E site so no tRNA will sit in there. And the role of the F-met tRNA, of course, is to get in the P site, in the middle. IF2 will sit on top of that, kind of like the, the superintendent, or he's the foreman, he's in charge, he's a GTP ace, and if IF2 looks around and says if IF1's in the right site, we don't have a tRNA stuck in there. IF3's in the E site, we don't have a tRNA stuck in there. mRNA's here, everything's where it's supposed to be, it will hydrolyze its GTP, and IF1, IF3, IF2 all leave. Right, they all get out of the way so that the 50S subunit can sit on top. And now this is called the 70S initiation complex. It's ready to receive the next tRNA. So we've started. The airport is ready to go. Okay? We got to get you there. Okay? So you just left the hotel. Right? You've got your hat on, top hat, your straw hat, your sombrero, your ball cap, whatever type of hat matched your shoes. You have it on. And you need to get to the airport. Well, you need to, you can't walk because you're going to get wet. And you're going to lose your amino acid. So how do you get to the airport? We're going to take a taxi, right? But it's not a very good taxi, right? It's not a taxi you want to ride in in reality. So imagine a taxi shows up. This taxi is called EFTU, right? So EF for elongation factor because it's in the continuation stage, not the beginning. So EFTU, not two, but TU, right? shows up and to pick you up at the hotel, right? It picks you up, but the way you get in this taxi is he rolls down the back window, you stick your head in and chest, and he rolls up the window and kind of sandwiches you in the window. Your feet, legs, and shoes are all hanging out the window as he drives to the airport. It doesn't sound fun, all right? We'll see why you must do it that way, but it does keep your head hat bond dry, okay? And you notice in this picture over here, in reality, this is the EFTU protein, and this is the tRNA, so only its head and chest are stuck in the protein, and the rest of the body is flapping in the wind, right? Or in this case, the rain, right? So it only holds on to this part. So your, your head and, and chest are stuck in this taxi's back window, and he drives you to the airport that way. But there's a reason. When you get to the airport, are you the next hat that needs to be delivered? How do we know? Well, we have a, a codon sitting there on the sidewalk, the guy holding the shoe box with the imprint of a shoe, and we need to check your shoes. Do your shoes, the anti-codon, fit? What's well, convenient that they're sticking out the window, he can just drive up, we check your shoes, it doesn't fit, get out of here. You're wrong, you're wrong TRNA, 
right? Wrong shoes. Eventually, the right one drives up. He checks many of these, and the checking is a whole other lecture we're not going to cover in this class. But it checks your shoes to the shoe box. If it does fit, you should be there. We're going to put you in the A site. However, we have a problem. Your head is stuck in the window, right? So we need to get you out of there. So another protein called EFTS, we're going to use it as a, a gas truck that shows up to refuel EFTU perhaps. But he's not a very good driver and he runs into the back of EFTU and ejects you out of the window. You're not wearing a seatbelt, obviously. So and now you're stuck into the A site. And that's called accommodation, where it accepts the correct tRNA in the A site. So that's how you get to the airport and that's how you get put into the A site. And then immediately, there's no, no ATP needed, but immediately the peptide bond is formed. Okay, so that's shown here in this picture. So here's the airport waiting for you in the first panel. Here's you showing up. I'm not showing the taxi holding your head, right? You get fit into the A site, and as soon as you get accommodated, you completely put it into the A site, the, the two tRNAs here shown in blue and green have their amino acid ends sitting directly next to each other. Now remind me one more time, the amino acid here, in this case, the methionine, the first one, is being held to its tRNA by an ester bond. And I have an amino acid also being held by an ester bond show up next to it with a free amino group. That amino group is immediately going to attack that carbonyl because that's what they do. And if an amino group attacks an ester bond, it's going to result in the breakage of the ester and the formation of an amide, which is far more stable. So this is a free reaction. We paid for it back when we paid the 2 ATP to put it on this tRNA. So it's a free peptide bond. And then we have a problem, right? Our mobile sidewalk operator, EFG, has to move you down the sidewalk. So think of him as a, uh, he turns on the mobile sidewalk, right? Which costs energy, ATP. We've got to spend it to move the sidewalk. So he turns on the sidewalk and you slide down the sidewalk, okay? And everything moves down. The A site moves into the P site, the P site moves into the E site, and what may have been in the E site or will be later is ejected. And that's a protein called EFG. It's an elongation factor G. Okay. Now we have an empty A site again, and we can play this game again. The next taxi shows up, we check a bunch of shoes, the right one gets put in, and this goes on and on and on until we get them all in there. Okay. So here's our EFG holding like a little lever, right? puts it in like a crowbar and slides you down the sidewalk, and then the EFG gets out of the way, and the next TRA can show up. Okay. This costs energy to do all this. In reality, it's not really a sidewalk, the ribosome kind of ratchets, right? The top and bottom subunits kind of ratchet with respect to each other. So they partially twist and move back to keep things moving, okay? So now I have an empty A site, and eventually we just keep growing the chain. So here's an ester bond shown here. A new amino acid shows up. This nitrogen in blue attacks the ester bond in red. We lose the ester linkage, and now I have a new peptide bond right there in black. That moves over to the P site, a brand new amino acid shows up with the, whatever the R group might be, and it attacks the blue carbonyl this time, and everybody gets moved down the chain. I'm making my protein, amino to carboxy in. Okay. So we continue doing this as the codons tell us until we come to a codon that isn't really a codon. It's one of our three that are called stop codons. No tRNA ever recognizes these things because there are no shoes that match these boxes, right? It, it's like a, instead of a shoe box, the imprint of a star. No one has a star-shaped shoe. Well, maybe they will in the future, but not yet, right? So there's no star-shaped shoe to fit the box. So how do you do this? Well, at this point, there's been a few collisions at the airport. And if this is Atlanta, we know what that might entail. Something might be on fire, right? We've had quite a few cars show up, maybe three, 400 amino acids get put in. Your hats get put on a row here. We stitch them together. There's probably something on fire. So when this UAA or UAG or UGA codon shows up, we know it's time to end this process. The hat chain needs to be detached from the TRA, the last one, and send it on its way and put out the fires at the airport. So the UAA, UGA, and UGA stop codons tell a fire truck to show up. Okay? And these fire trucks are called release factors. Now we couldn't call them termination factors because that sounds so much like transcription factors and we have a TF, so that's a bad idea. So we call them release factors and they stop translation. 
Okay, and there's only three of them. Now you got to keep in mind, uh, and if if you aren't listening to the lectures, you're probably going to get this question wrong. There are three stop codons: UAA, UAG, and UGA. And I want you to write these down real quick. I know they're not listed in this order on the screen, but I want you to write them down in this order, on top of each other. So I want you to write UAG, and directly underneath it, write UAA, lining up the letters, and directly under that, write UGA. So the UAG on top, UAA in the second row, and then UGA in the third row underneath it. And what can you tell me about those three stop codons? Well, they all start with U, I agree. The next two bases are always purines. I can make that generalization. However, not UGG, that was tryptophan. So without UGG, we'll exclude that one, but it's always a pair of purines. And then I ask you a question, where does the A purine appear? Is it in the, not the U of course, but in the first purine spot or in the second purine spot, which are effectively the second and third spots of the codon? If the A appears in the first purine spot, so UAG, the first one you wrote, or UAA, that is gonna use release factor one. If the A appears in the second purine spot, which is the, the third position, that's going to be the UAA again, and the UGA, we will use release factor 2. So we have some overlap here. UAA can be recognized by either fire truck. UAG only by the one labeled RF1, and UGA only by the one labeled RF2. Okay. So shown at the bottom here, we used UAA. It could have been RF2, but RF1 shows up, fits in the A site, and here's the weird part of the town again. Something's on fire, and this fire truck shows up and forgot to bring the water. Typical cytoplasm, right? So we need some help. So they call another fire truck. The one with the ladder shows up, the RF3. RF3 doesn't recognize any stop codons. It recognizes one of the other insufficient fire trucks, RF1, RF2. Okay? So RF3 shows up, and it brings a, a eyedropper of water. That's all we need to put out this fire. We need one water molecule. Right? So RF3 shows up, extends the ladder, and literally there's an alpha helix that unfurls and reaches up into the site up here, right, where we make the peptide bonds. And remember, this last hat, this last amino acid, is being held by what kind of bond? Simply an ester bond. Ester. Right, just a simple old ester bond. And I can break that. We've been trying to keep it dry this whole time. I can break it if I let one water molecule. So it extends this little alpha helix ladder. And one brave water molecule climbs the ladder because it can get up there. They're going to do it. The solvent will make its way in there and interact with that ester bond and break it. And now your protein, our series of hats, is free to hop on a plane and go to Bermuda or wherever it's going, right? Or fold up and be a, a functional part of society in this, in this uh, fictional world, right? But then look at our airport. We have a mess. We just put out some fires. We had uh, 300 collisions. We got parts of tRNAs everywhere. I think we should just bulldoze the airport and start over. Okay? And that's what the cell does, right? So much like Atlanta. So if there's a problem, we'll just bulldoze that and rebuild it. So I'm, I'm being facetious, but it, it fits the analogy. So we call that to sound green, and I put it in green on purpose. To sound more green, it's called ribosome recycling factor. I'm gonna call it a bulldozer, right? It comes along and tears the entire ribosome apart. So the mRNA, the small subunit, the large subunit, all the proteins, the tRNAs, the RF1 or 2 that's there, the RF3 that's there, everybody gets destroyed, right? Well, not necessarily destroyed, but everybody gets ripped apart. Right? And we're going to call it the recycling factor so we can get some funding for it. It sounds green. Right? So it's completely torn apart. And then we can start all over again, have a bunch of people get ready at their hotels, build another airport, and make another protein. Okay? Um, I'll save this, this if you want to read it. I'm not going to ask you too much about it on the test, but it's a recent edition, and I know we're running out of time for it. But sometimes the, the shoes slip, right? And as my analogy for that, we're going to use ice skates as shoes. And the box that they're holding is just a big block of ice. So it's kind of hard to match up exactly with your coat on, and sometimes you'll slip and you get a frame shift, right? So it's a slippery sequence. That's why I picked the ice skates for that. So if you want to read over that, here's how that works. And I give you a, a link at the bottom if you want to read more about it. Okay. So that's another page for the, the program, the ribosomal frame, uh, frame shifting. 
This is done on purpose for a lot of genes. 